What I want to do is to describe a class of material that informally you can think of as being soft and squishy. These don't sound like technical terms, and they're not technical terms to say something is squishy. So the more technical word that you apply is that these are soft material or complex fluid. And the interesting thing about them is that you see them everywhere, but you may not have thought about them. I want to get you to thinking about these materials, because what's interesting about them is that to think about them in a scientific way, you need to know some physics, you need to know some chemistry, you need to even know some biology, plus maybe a bit of chemical engineering, a bit of mechanical engineering. It sits in this space in between many of the other things. Usually when we study sciences in school, we think of chemistry class, we go to physics class, we go to biology class, we go to math class. But it's rare to find some air, some field of study where you need to know enough about all of these different fields in order to be able to say something sensible. I just want to give you a feeling for what that is and to remind you of the many examples around us where you see behavior of this sort. So I'm going to describe these three examples. We'll talk about ice cream right at the end of the talk. We'll talk about tomato ketchup, and we'll talk about toothpaste. And this is just going to be three of the examples that I will tell you about. And I chose these examples because they're everyday examples. The stuff that you will have seen multiple times, will have used multiple times. And I want to tell you a little bit about the science that goes into understanding them. In particular, how they flow, how they behave, and how one makes them to do precisely what one needs in a particular situation. Their consistency, their texture, their ability to flow are all very really different. And this comes as a result of thinking very deeply, both from the technology side as well as from the side of science. So that's where science and the ability to make things that are suited for purpose come together. Here's an example we won't talk about, but this is a nice example of a soft material, the idli that you have, that many of you have eaten, many, pretty much all of you have seen. Imagine holding it and squishing it like this. It comes back. It's a soft material. It's not like the material here, which is hard. This so what is it about softer materials that are interesting and useful? And how are they made? Keep this example in mind. Keep the example of ice cream and the other, the other examples I showed you of ketchup and so on. We look a little bit into what makes them what they are. These are conventional hard materials. This is a slice of a tree. Over here you can see the ring. This is a Taj Mahal, that's marble, set in an image. This is as hard as the stuff that you can see here. That's even harder than the material that you make there. And that's a different category. Unlike the idli, I can't imagine squishing it like this and seeing it deform or bend under the pressure that I have done. Okay? We should have these two broad categories in mind. We should think of stuff that's really soft, easily deformed, so that changes its shape. And we should think of stuff that's hard at the other end. And there's, of course, lots of stuff in between. And often it's in between stuff that's also going to be of interest to us. What do we need to know? Where do we start? So, one starting point is everything is made up of atoms. And there's one thing that all of you will have understood by now that, first of all, all of nature, everything that you see around you, is made up of different combinational elements taken from this periodic table. In fact, some of the more exotic elements here, moscovium, fluorobium, etc., you never have seen, you probably never will see, you will never encounter in your life. But some subset of these, let's say the 20 to 30 most abundant elements here, basically go up into making everything that you see. And just that statement itself is important enough. Why is there this entire diversity that you see can be accounted for by a limited number of elements and the way in which they're connected together? First of all, that's our basic building block. Anything that we want to describe must come from this structure itself. The atoms make molecules together. Here are molecules C2H6, the ammonia molecule that sits here, oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, all relatively sized correctly in terms of the broad size of the, of the atoms. But the complexity of life that we see comes from taking atoms and making them into more complex arrangements. Which is going to make it more complicated. Molecules can be much, much more complex than the simple ammonia that I showed you here. You can have long, long, long molecules. 
So what's a good example of a long, long, long term cure? Anybody? Have you heard of DNA? How many of you have heard of DNA? Okay, very good. So let's do some numbers. In your body, there are about 10 trillion cells. That's 1, that's 10, followed by 12 zeros after that. That's the number of cells that your body has. Pretty much all of those cells have the same broad feature. There's a cell membrane outside, they have a nucleus. Inside the nucleus is the DNA. The DNA is fed in the form of chromosomes. And in the vast majority of the cells in your body, the vast, vast, vast majority of the cells in your body, it's 23 pairs of chromosomes that exist in each of these cells. Each chromosome is one long molecule. Okay? That's interesting. So, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes in the cells in your body. For example, the cell that I have taken from my skin. And each of those, so totally 23 to 46, there's 46 long molecules inside each cell. So what do I mean by long molecule? If I take each of those, if I take chromosome number one, the copy of chromosome number one, chromosome number two, copy of chromosome number two, etc., stretch it out like that, and I basically tie them together. So out of these 46 individual molecules, I make one very, very, very long chain. Tell me how long that chain is in terms of where my hand should be. Have a guess. Is it so, is it big enough to see? Is it about this thick? About this thick? Huh? Big enough for the finger. Okay, that's a good guess. Anyone else? Be brave, it doesn't matter. Like it can circle the earth? Hmm? It can circle the earth? <laughs> can it circle the earth? No. That it can't. That's really large, so we need to eliminate that. Just one, inside one cell, the amount of DNA. Oh, so I'll, 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 I'll tell you what the answer is. It's approximately about here, between the ground and here. That's about two meters. Yeah, I guess about that, right? Yeah. The tallest basketball players are around two meters. There's someone who is 1.96 meters, someone who's 2.04 meters. But that's approximately a really, really tall person about there is about two meters. That's one cell. Take the 2 meter, multiply that by 10 and 12 zeros after that. That's a lot of meters. In fact, it's enough meter to go from Earth to the Sun about 80 times. So the part we're going around the Earth is, is not, I mean, it is far away from that much, much larger number. But it tells you the number is large. So in that sense, it's a, it gets the, says that these legs are much larger than you can comprehend. So in your body, if I took each of these molecules out, Put them in <coughs> and stretch them up one after the other. Just the cells in your body. That's one super long thing. So it's interesting to see that your body contains stuff that is actually that long. That the DNA that you all heard of is actually made up of these long sub molecules. Each chromosome is just one molecule. Okay? So these molecules are called polymers. Poly because you're adding different units together. The units are called monomers. Adding many monomers together gives you a poly. Okay. The other complication is, of course, one that you understand, that atoms and molecules can be in different physical states, and there are lots of them. So why don't I have a full glass? This doesn't work at the level of one or two or three molecules. But why don't I have a full glass of molecules, a full batch of molecules, the numbers are large enough. So then you can see transitions between different states, one in which they're perfectly arranged together so in nice separation from each other in a crystal that's a solid. They can be liquid like. So the example here would be ice, which is a solid, water, which is a liquid, and if I heat the water enough above 100 degrees centigrade, I would then have a gas. So these are different physical states of the same molecule. Okay? So we've said we can make molecules out, we can make a bewildering variety of molecules. So this is a very simple physics loss in the periodic table. These molecules can be small, but they can also be very long. And they can exist in different physical states. They can be gas-like, they can be solid-like, and they can be liquid-like. So now we can play around in the combination of these. And then begin to ask, how do we tune the properties of the materials that we want to study in an appropriate way? 
So what do we mean by big is small? If you look at one big number, I said the number of cells in your body is 10 followed by 12, 0, 10 trillion. Okay. An atom here is around 10 to the power minus 10 meters. Let's put a zero, put a decimal point, count nine zeros, and then a one. And that's approximately the size of an atom in meters. The size of cells is 0 0.000001, so it's roughly small. It's important enough to have its own name, it's called a micron. So if anyone asks you how big is a cell, maybe it's roughly around 1 to 10 microns, depending upon the cell. The smallest cells are bacteria, which are pretty much about 2 microns in size. That's one way to remember it. And those of you who remember this will remember there's another way of writing this. To write this is 10 to the power minus 6. We just leave it there if you haven't seen this earlier. It's just a way of remembering and writing it rather than writing lots of zeros out together. It's a simple way of remembering this number. It's also important because things are constantly shaking around if they're really small. This is called Brownian motion. Those of you who've done the sort of learned about the microscope yesterday and the previous day, we have figured out that whenever you look at living things under the microscope, things are constantly moving. Okay, even the stuff inside the latest molecule, or they're made up of complex molecules, the little organisms made up of even more complex molecules, but they're constantly in motion. They're in motion because they're at room temperature. And that room temperature takes very small things and kicks them around all over the place. So it's called Brownian motion. And anything that's as small as a cell or smaller is constantly subject to Brownian motion. That's another thing to remember. And I guess that would be important when we talk about what is soft. What about time scale? How long? A uh, hummingbird flutters its wings about 80 times per minute, I think. Maybe even possible. Your heart beats at about 70 beats per minute. Okay. But there are things that happen very, very slowly. For example, you look at this glacier here. The glacier also flows. It's like a river. But it flows very, 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 very slowly. It moves about a few centimeters every year. So that's an example of some a physical process that happens exceedingly slowly. The physical process that operates when your heart beats, etc., is something that's much faster than that. Scale. So if you have a second here, this can take years, this can take microseconds, and 10 to the power minus 9 seconds is a nanosecond. It's going to be a very, very, very short interval of time. Okay? So we've talked about lengths, we've talked about time scale, which are things can be slow, for example, the glacier flowing, or they can be fast, for example, your heart beating double and double, 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 double. They can be faster than that. So the questions that you might ask about any material are the following. How are the atoms tied together? How do they? What does it make for simple molecules, and what makes for long molecules, and what is their behavior? Is the material that you're studying a mixture of different molecules? How do you make idli, for example? You take idli rice, you take dal, you add water to that, add a bit of salt, you grind it until it forms fine, soft consistency, you ferment it over there, and what you have left at the end of that is something that really has very soft behavior, flows relatively easily. But its inner structure is fairly complicated in terms of all the stuff that went into it. Right. Even a grain of rice that goes each grain of rice is fairly complicated on so much as complicated by chemical structures inside. Then is the substance overall solid, liquid, or a bit of both? And what we'll be talking about is stuff that sits in between solids and liquids. And that's what makes soft, squishy stuff interesting. Now I'll give you lots of examples of these So you have here are my examples: toothpaste, shampoo, cream, contrast, mud, paint, blood, all of these. These are all squishy materials. And the other word for this is the complex fluid or soft matter fluid. You can imagine here taking a little piece of such squishy material and look to look at it how it flows. You can imagine doing this in your laboratory with stuff. You can imagine it doing it with a battery that goes into it. Any battery it will function similarly if I pick it up. So here are examples again that we will describe a little later. But what can we say now about what goes into this? Soft and squishy materials are usually mixtures of different types of atoms and molecules. They're not yeah. simple. They're not like water, for example. Water is soft and squishy. It's just made up of one type of molecule, the water molecule, the H2O. They often include long polymers, and that's what gives them the type of interesting behavior that you want. 
and they have properties that are in between those of solids and liquids. Okay? So let's look at the video of this. And then I want to point out what's unusual about this video. Let's start the talk. Change the positions of atoms. It's hard to move them around because they're very regularly here. One, 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 one. And that's what makes the crystal. The crystal is a regular arrangement of atoms. It is a regularity that defines the crystal and also makes it hard, gives it its own shape, its characteristic shape, and makes it hard to deform because the atoms like to be in a fixed position with respect to each other. So they would like to move atoms here, here, outward, etc. Whereas the liquid is perfectly fine with that. That's an important distinction. But you don't really have to have a crystal. You don't really have to have anything nicely arranged one after the other in a crystalline arrangement. This also works. The glass here, the same glass that you might get in a regular glass if you drink water out. That's a nice example because it's solid. Of course it's solid. I can pick it up my hand and not go through it. But atoms inside the glass are not arranged in a regular manner. So that's a solid without being a crystal. So we've looked at solids that are crystals, solids that are not crystals, and of course now we have to look at liquids again, which are neither solids nor solids which are not crystals. Just to give you an idea of the variety of the different types of materials that can exist. This is a solid, non-crystalline, yet flexible material. The same material that goes in here. These are all squished up plastic bottles. This is a solid, because it can, it, 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 it's hard to change its shape. Over here, it's flexible so they can squish them. And again, they're not crystal, they're made up of long polymers that are tied together in a particular way to give you this particular structure. Here's another example this is soft and flexible. And you can touch your yellow with your finger. These are materials that you can actually deform to squish your yellow like this. That's a biological material, that's a soft and deformable material. It's also flexible. It's solid, it doesn't flow, your yoga your is not flowing down like this. But it's flexible, it's soft. So you can see with all of these examples what immense variety that exists in these materials. That's a fluid, that's a real fluid. It's water flowing there. You can see that it's changing its shape, it's by under the action of the wind, you have a wave that's forming and actually breaking. And this flows. There's a different category than the other stuff. We looked at stuff as a solid, stuff as crystalline, stuff as flexible as solid and not crystalline. All of the examples we looked at, but now we're looking at things that really that can't be confused with anything else. And that would be one example. The material is rivers that flow down from glaciers that are melting. These are suspensions. 
because it sounds important. Water is the most important component to them. So there are lots of fine powdery stuff. So they come from things that melted, are carried together with them, little grains of sand, little grains of dust, little bits of suspended biological matter that come from the trees that are falling. All of that together makes this slightly turbid, slightly, you know, it's not pure, pure transparent water, as you might see. So that change in color, especially the sort of color that you get, slightly muddy color that you get, and flow down from the mountains, comes from the fact that it contains all this stuff. And this is called a bench. It's a type of fluid which is determined by the fact it has a fluid water component typically, but also stuff inside. These are man made materials. They, they don't occur naturally in nature. But they have special properties that it's important to get right. They determine how they function. Here's another well, man made, as if you could call it, or naturally made. Again, illustrating flexibility. This is a structure that has bones inside. You have a bone here, a bone here, <coughs> a flexible joints in between, pathways that can move around. It's interesting to see how flexible the human body actually is. Any of you who dance will actually be familiar with the notion of flexibility and the ability to change your body in such a way. That's again soft living tissue in such a body whose shape can be changed, articulation can be changed in various ways. This is a bendy joint. For those of you who played with this, again, you can reproduce some of the shapes that you get in terms of dancers. Again, this is made so that you can change the position of the, of the anchor points between this part and this part. Also. But remember, the flexible living materials also grow. And that's the difference between living and non-living. Non-living stuff doesn't grow. But this little baby here is going to grow up into something that looks like this over here and maintain that level of flexibility to an extremely flexible way. It's very hard to. I'm pretty sure that none of you could, maybe some of you could, I certainly could sit and, and bite my toe exactly as this baby is doing. So, okay. so there's some practice one can do with this. Thing. So the other important thing to remember is that living things are special because they also contain information. This baby here will grow up into a big woman or man. But all the information contained in that big woman or man must be present inside the baby. So the ability to take information and convert it into something that's growing and maintain the same two eyes, legs, etc. the baby are also there in the big grown-up person. So that's how we say that information, the way information is transferred in time, it's also important to think about how living soft materials are actually different from non-living soft materials. So let's talk about, now that we've described them, what, so far what we've done is just do description told you what different types of soft, hard, twisty, shape changing, etc. What you use that. Let's talk a little bit, again, to be very qualitative about how solids and liquids are different from each other. And the essential idea here is deformation and how see material responds when you try to change their shape. Okay? The deformation is a change of shape. And there are materials that resist being deformed and materials that are easy to deform. And that's you can say that soft materials are easy to deform, hard materials are resistant to deform. They very take a lot of energy to actually change them. So here's an example of a material that resists having its shape changed. That's a bar of metal, the hard rock. You can see stone, pieces of large pebbles that you can see there. But these, for example, are materials whose shape can easily be changed. The children play in with foam over here. This is a piece of spine that you can push like this. And that's a piece of plasticine that you can pull out and change its shape. The difference when I talk about hard to deform, if I really want to deform something like this, I would have something like in some very, very muscular people, it's kind of a muscle, who will be required to change the shape of something like this. On the other hand, soft and squishy materials don't need someone like this to deform them. And roughly the softness of a piece of material tells you you need something like this to actually change the shape or something much less. Just, just pushing them in your hand is that sufficient to change its shape or to be able to deform. So the softer the material, the less the force that you require. And as I said, with just little hands here, we can change the shape of something. This is called slime. Right? 
in by in the shop. You can see the people flying that was hung up over there. And now, under the action of gravity, ordinary things pull it down like this and changing its shape as if it's in this particular example. So this is a good point to talk about one important word and that's called elasticity. Elasticity is the idea that materials have a natural shape. They cause energy to move away from that natural shape. So take something like this, the sponge here. Squish it out, the water inside it, squish it out and release it. It goes back to the shape that it had before. So take it here, squish it, put it back, it goes back to its earlier shape, which was the shape that you can see here. So rubber bands, why do you don't stretch it too much? When you say elastic band, you mean rubber band. It means something like this. Why do you go put it too hard? Put it just a little bit. It goes back into the earlier shape. These are materials that are elastic. Okay. Plastic materials are materials that don't go back to the area of shape. If you deform them too much, as with the rubber band, they change their shape irreversibly. Here's an example of something whose shape is changed irreversibly. The car doesn't go back to its earlier form, it's just being bent. Typically, by heating it, you can sort of squish it, and then after that, once you let it cool, it's very hard to fix it back to its earlier shape. So, plastic materials don't go back to their own shape. After you deform. It's a very useful distinction to keep in mind. So, what's the distinction between plastic and elastic materials of the sort that I described to you and the flow in said flow? That's an important distinction to understand when we talk about soft materials. These are materials that have no natural shape. Okay? For example, if you're pouring something into these glasses, you can see that. Stuff inside here takes the shape of the container. Contrast this with taking an ice cube and putting it into the same glass. The ice cube remains an ice cube. It's independent of whether it's a big glass, a small glass, put it on the table. The ice cube, the, the cube of ice or cube of sugar or whatever it is, retains the same shape. On the other hand, this doesn't do that. If I chose a different glass, a more flatter glass, a larger glass, etc., the shape will take is the shape of the container. So it's flow out into the shape of the container. So the lesson from here is that fluids have a natural shape. They take the shape of the container to their end. And then the question is, what does it mean to deform it? How do I deform a fluid if it's perfectly happy with any shape that I can change it? If I take it in a shape like this, turn it to turn the glass over, it's changed the shape. It moves around and it's perfectly happy to do that. That's a different shape. So when a liquid and a fluid, a fluid and a liquid are really to be the same thing. I use these words in the same way. These flow, they take the shape of their container. What does it mean to deform them in certain ways? So here's an important idea. That fluids are happy to take any shape that you want. Any weird glass that you might choose, say a whole bunch of glasses here. You pour your liquid into them, they will take the shape of that glass, of the container, of the container that it holds. But how fast do you allow that change to happen? How fast it accommodates to that new shape? That's what matters. So the fluid resists changes in shape, even though it's perfectly happy with the final shape. So the change from one shape to the other is what the fluid does. Look at some examples of where that happens. Why it happens. Any change in shape needs molecules to move across the cell. Some molecules that was there. They now have to move here, something that was there has to move here. They have to accommodate to the different containers in the set. So the crucial point is that different parts of the liquid don't like to move at different speeds. It doesn't like to go faster than something here. The moment different parts of the liquid move at different speeds, the liquid resists that. It doesn't want to do that. And the way to quantify this is something called a viscosity. And here the example is think of water and think of honey. They flow very differently. Anyone who Tell the food and try to pour water into your mouth or try to pour honey into your mouth. We'll recognize that for the honey, you really have to wait. It comes out very, very slowly. One way to do this is an experiment that looks like this. So, this is a different type of oil with different viscosity. This is low viscosity, this is high viscosity. And the experiment consists of taking a round metal box and dropping it on the top in each of these. The more the resistance to this as falling to the liquid, the slower it falls. 
So this low viscosity liquid has very little resistance, and the ball has reached way down in the same interval of time. Let's give it one second or two seconds to come down. In the high viscosity liquid, it moves very, very slowly. It only reaches here compared to this machine. So here's an experiment that enables you to compare liquids of different viscosities. And the viscosity here enters in the resistance to something that is moving through it. And why does that happen? Because liquids have to move, uh, liquid molecules have to move around the thing that is falling. For this to fall here, what's in front of it must move around. That involves different parts of the liquid moving with different speeds. Liquids don't like that. So viscosity is a measure of how much they don't like. If they don't like it at all, that's a highly viscous liquid. They move very, very slowly, very reluctant to move around. In a low viscosity liquid, it's pretty happy to move on very fast. And anything is falling through, falls through fairly fast. Okay? Is that clear? Here's a nice experiment which does exactly the same thing. It takes something that flows very, 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 very slowly. And then it just waits for how long it takes for this little drop to fall. So this, there were 10 years or 7 years between two drops falling. So this is a very, very long experiment. It probably started some 50 or 60 years ago. But, and now they only make the eighth drop. And it's kind of interesting to see how slow things can be. We said glaciers were flowing in the rate of a few centimeters per year. Here's something that could potentially be even slower than that. For a single drop to fall, it takes somewhere around 10 years. You can imagine that this is an experiment. It takes a long time. The person who started it is not the person who's currently doing it because of he retired, he went somewhere else, and someone else took over from his job. What we are interested in when we talk about soft materials is that it's in between. It's not quite solid, it's not quite liquid. And whether they behave like liquids or solids depends upon how fast you make them change their shape and by how much. Okay. And of course, as I said, shapes change because atoms and molecules move out of their old position to occupy a new position. If you change the shape too fast, the atoms and molecules cannot keep up. They resist it. And when resisting a change in shape is the property of the solid. If you do it very slowly, they have enough time to move out. They don't resist the change in shape, but that's the property of the liquid. Again, here, interesting point. That whether it behaves like a solid or whether it behaves like a liquid simply depends upon how fast you want to change its shape. Okay? So here's an example of a swimmer. All of, I guess most of you must swim. So you already you, you know about the resistance that water gives you when you try and swim. And we swim by pushing water out from the front and using the momentum from pushing that out to propel ourselves forward. Okay? You can just imagine that you're on a warm summer day. And I'm sure if I see the trying to imagine the sensation of that. Someone falling from a great height through the atmosphere. It's also kind of like that. We don't think of it in the same way, but they also encounter the same sort of air resistance that the swimmer does. The swimmer feels water resistance, the skydiver feels air resistance. And the reason the skydiver releases the parachute is to increase that resistance. So that just like the ball that we saw in the high viscosity limit, the ball descended very slowly. The skydiver also descends very slowly once this parachute has opened up. So a parachute has opened up. Example is two people skydiving together, falling through. And there's in the sort of time between the, the parachute opening up, there's a sort of wonderful, for a couple of, for a few minutes when you're actually basically falling, you can enter all these interesting positions relative to each other, use your hands and hands and forward. But ask yourself, if you did not have a parachute to throw you down, and you fell into water, you fell into the ocean from a height. So a normal plane, let's say, flies at about 10, 10 kilometers high for 50,000 feet. But we don't need to go that high, let's just say we're falling from just a couple kilometer up. We're just jumping out. We think, hey, I'm going to fall into the ocean. I know how to swim. This should be easy. The answer is, as you fall, you're trying to change the shape of the liquid around you very fast. You're falling down fast. 
So maybe they have to move out from where you are. But people do like to move out fast. Liquids are viscous. Depending on how fast you try to change the shape, you resist that. That's exactly what's going to happen when you fall fast into water from when basically like getting concrete. You may not have thought of this, but don't try this. Don't try jumping from a, from a sufficient height into water. So it will not be a pleasant experience that you associate with swimming. It will actually be very painful. Painful enough to break all the bones in your body. Those of you who also died long so that you die on your stomach will also have felt the same feeling. So it's actually very painful. A good thing to do. <coughs> Another movie that illustrates some of these things. So the glass, when you move it slowly, the glass didn't move. So the liquid didn't resist the motion. That's correct. So the liquid didn't resist the motion when the person did it slowly. When he did it fast, what happened? The whole glass moved. So the whole glass moving is something that is solid. The glass is behaving like a solid when it tries to move it around. It's moving with this thing together. But then you will slowly move like a liquid stuff inside. And again, that's a distinction between doing, changing the shape of something slowly and changing it fast. You change it fast, it behaves more solid like you change it slowly, it behaves more liquid like. So let's get to the first of our example, which is ketchup. How many of you have used ketchup in the recent past? Okay, I'll put it sugar now. No, none of you? Okay. So here's a cartoon. Starts here. There's someone walking through a desert, the hot sun, the cactus, etc. Sees a bottle of ketchup. Lifts a bottle of ketchup. Takes it. He's trying to eat it. Finally gives up. And becomes a skeleton. And then ketchup actually flows up. Those of you who are used to the older ketchup bottle that were made out of glass will remember this. That you really shake it, hit it in the back, etc. There's a long period in which ketchup just doesn't flow. Modern bottles of ketchup are made of plastic. You can actually press on them and force them to come out. And they're also treated on the inside in a special chemical manner. So that the molecules of the ketchup don't really stick to the edges of the bottle. Why is that? And that's where what ketchup is made of it begins to play a role into how it behaves when it flows. That's where the molecules of the ketchup actually look like. They're all tied together. They behave in a solid like The technical word is a gel. By shaking the bottle and disrupting the connection between these long molecules inside the ketchup and breaking them up a little bit. And then once I do that, it begins to flow like a fluid. That's the idea. Just holding the bottle, the ketchup bottle like this, that person in the desert was doing, is not sufficient to actually make it. In fact, the old bottle has to shake quite a bit before the living thing actually came out. It took time to do that. But finally, what is done there in the process of shaking the bottle is to take something that is basically all tied up like a solid, it breaks those connections and makes it flow like a liquid. Toothpaste also has interesting problems. So what's interesting about toothpaste? Again, this, I don't, you should think about this if you haven't thought about it already. Toothpaste has to behave in very specific ways for it to be useful. If I do take toothpaste and I open the cap out and hold it like this, it should not go out, otherwise we don't use it at all. If I press on the container of toothpaste, it has to begin to flow. That's what toothpaste actually does, toothpaste to that piece. Once I stop pressing on it, the toothpaste that comes out over here 
has to stop flowing again. Because otherwise, just imagine, I fill a toothpaste bottle up with water, I try to hold it like this, the water flows out. I squish it out, the water, I squish it on top of the toothbrush, it also flows out. That has not the, none of the behavior that I expect it to have if it really should be toothpaste. So it has to be able to flow when it's applied pressure on it. It has to stop flowing the moment I stop applying pressure. And even gravity should not pull it down when it sits on top of the toothpaste. On your toothbrush, you shouldn't have to worry about it flowing off the brush. The worry is the yield point. There's a certain minimum amount of force that I will exert on the toothpaste so it starts to flow. Over here, there's a relatively light little weight here, and that's not enough to make the toothpaste flow. If I take my toothpaste and I squish it a little bit, that won't be good enough for that. I need a larger weight here to make it actually flow. The below the yield point, toothpaste does not flow, so it's always behaving like a solid. Above, it flows out, behaving like a liquid. But there's more to toothpaste. Why do we use toothpaste? The answer is this. One, uh, apart from sort of wanting to smell nice in the morning when you get up, the reason is that you build up a film of bacteria on your teeth. Mm -hmm. So the stomach, anything that you ingest, that you chew, etc., etc., contains nutrients which are used by bacteria to survive in this. They form a little what's called a biofilm on your face. It's important these biofilms lead to certain unpleasant smells, etc., etc. It's not good for your dental hygiene. So you need to remove them. You remove them with toothpaste. So the toothpaste is a big flowing object once it gets out there. You must add certain ingredients to the toothpaste that make it easier to remove. Biofilms. And those are what are called the abrasive agents that can remove, they should be able to remove the stain that the bacteria provides, but not spoil your teeth completely. So you don't want to find a way to your teeth in the process of removing the bacteria. Why does toothpaste foam? You brush your teeth, hold it or or hands or whatever this is, you see this foamy sensation. Where does that foam come from? That foam comes. Because it contains a material called a surfactant. Detergents are surfactants, the soap, the resin, and the whip, etc. They all contain largely surfactants. And these surfactants that enable you to break down and separate out the little bits of bacteria on your teeth that are removed by the abrasive, but then have to flow out when you rinse your mouth into the sink. So you see how all this has to work together. You need something that is, has a certain physical property, it should flow. Easily, if you apply pressure on it, it should stop flowing when you remove that pressure. It should not flow under gravity because it has to sit on your toothpaste. It must contain a base of agents that removes the, that removes the bacterial biofilms on your teeth. It must contain foaming agents to give you the pleasant feeling of having brushed your teeth in the, in the appropriate flavors, etc. But those foaming agents also help you remove the little pieces of bacteria that are floating around when you rinse your mouth in your throat. It's interesting very briefly to tell you what these surfactant molecules are like and what they do. A surfactant molecule looks like this. It has one part which is a head part, which is used to round parts here, and two parts which are polymers, which are called the tails. So typically, it's kind of one tail or two tails, most often <coughs> there's two tails. And these molecules get together like this. And what's special about them is this head part likes water, the tail part likes oil. Okay? So if I take this and put it at a mixture of oil and water, suppose I take oil and water together and mix it up as the factor to it. So that means we go to the part that separates the water and the oil. Oil and water don't mix. If I put them together after wait a while, I have an oil layer and a water layer. Add the fact so that the factor will sit at the boundary between the oil and the water. Okay. Once it sits at that boundary, it it able to pull it out much more easily. If I shake it up, form many little, small little droplets of oil surrounded by water, with a surfactant in between. And then now I can sort of separate out the water and oil very easily by just flowing it out. Okay? So again, there, that's the technology of making toothpaste. Also talk to the basic science of what toothpaste is all about. Here is a not so nice example of surfactant. This is the Yamuna, not too far from here, in this particular season of the year. That's foam, and that foam comes from detergents. Those detergents are those from the effluents from the factory, as well as household use of, of uh, you know, shampoos and so on and so forth. So, 
not so nice. We don't like to see uh, important bodies of water really looking terrible, covered with foam. In this abnormally high level of surfactant, as they say, as well as other things like phosphates and such other things. So there's a lot more that goes into toothpaste. We need binding agents that prevent it from separating out. And if, if we didn't have these components, it could dry out or require some sort of mixing for everything to get together again. We don't want to do that. We just want to be able to use it as toothpaste today, tomorrow, day after, one month from now, two months from now, without having to do anything to it. Also, flavoring. The distinction between toothpaste and you what know, is between one toothpaste and another. Why do you prefer one? Because you like the flavor of it, you like the taste of it. Or your mother or father likes it too, typically, you know, in your family. And so you tend to buy the same toothpaste. Okay, you will experiment. But what makes up your mind is the packaging, as well as the flavor of the toothpaste. Some people like bean flavored toothpaste, some people don't. That is an important choice. All of this has to be added to the toothpaste for the consumer to be able to make a decision for what they want to do. My second example is this one. How many of you have had a live stream in recent weeks, in the last week? How many of you have thought of ice cream and what makes them special? Okay, good. Talk to them or uh, even them? Okay, alright. So let's think a little bit about this ice cream, what it does. There's a lot of stuff that goes into ice cream. If you pick up the ice cream packet and look at it, there's a bottle of ice cream and ask, what does it say? Does it say water, sweetness, saving, emulsifier, stabilizers, milk, fat, milk, solid, etc. Or does it say? But so all of these have a very precise role in determining the taste texture of the ice cream. The first thing to remember is the ice cream mixes together two components that don't like it. It mixes essentially oil and water together, sweetened water together. So the liquid particle of fat, okay, that is spread through a mixture of water, sugar and ice with air bubbles inside that give it a particular texture. Fat doesn't mix well in water. So the fat can then can set an ice cream that tends to separate out, and we don't want that to happen. Together with that, little air bubbles, ice crystals in water, and a network of these globules come together. That gives you the feeling of the ice cream, or the fact of the ice cream. First of all, how do you prevent the fat from separating out? You add something called an emulsifier, it's also a surfactant, which makes these stable. It doesn't it prevents it from separating out altogether. And they hold this whole structure in place with the liquid together. The stabilizers, which you also read in, your, in the description of what goes into the ice cream, make the texture creamy, keeps consistency somewhat uniform, and prevent large crystals of ice form. Sometimes, if you remember, not so much with the newer ice cream, but the older ice cream, you get a slightly painful sensation when you bite into it, because you bit into somewhat large ice crystals. You don't want that to happen, you want the ice crystals to remain small. And these quantities, the stabilizers, may keep the ice crystals from growing too much in size. Of course, what makes the ice cream special for us is the sugar that goes into it. And ice cream manufacturers add a lot of sugar. Okay. So here's an interesting biological path to ice cream. It's not just the ice cream effect, but who's consuming it. When you consume it, you're consuming cold ice cream. On a warm day, you are ask for a knife to pick it up, put it in your mouth. It's cold. What cold does is to interact with your taste buds to make them less sensitive. In particular, less sensitive to sugar. So you need to add even more sugar to make sure that you have that sensation of sweetness. Okay. So normal ice cream meant to be consumed at cold temperature and when it's really cold, the ice cream is cold has an excess of sugar compared to what is what is normally acceptable in levels of sugar. It's easy to test them because take your ice cream, wait for it to melt, and drink the melted ice cream. You'll find it very sweet. That's because of the excess of sugar that's being added, because your taste buds are less sensitive at cold when, when it gets colder and when it's warm. The ice crystals that form are an important part of the taste. The soft serve ice cream that you might get contain very small ice crystals. So you need to freeze it quickly before allowing these crystals to expand inside. 
But it's still about 60% of water when you serve it at the usual temperature, not all of it is frozen. That makes it scoopable. I can pick it up, take it out, and, 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 and remove it and put it in your house. These are all nice examples of what I want to illustrate with this example is this is something that you consume. As a consumer, whether it's toothpaste, whether it's ice cream, it has to be adjusted to your needs. That means there is some technology that goes into providing it in the form that is useful for you. There's some advertising that goes into saying that, oh, this is the perfect toothpaste or the perfect ice cream. But there's also a lot of science that goes into optimizing those conditions. And we saw that with the ice cream. The ice cream must, you know, at, at not, you don't have, should not have to freeze it at very low temperatures. It has to have to add the amount of sugar that is that you can sense the sensation of sweet, even though it's cold. You should not allow the oil droplets to separate out from the water. If you must not allow the ice crystals to get too big. All of these go into designing the rice of life. Even something as simple as ice cream is very, very characteristic. And you can ask what distinguishes you know, Harbin Dal from Amul ice cream, something like that. All of these, these different versions. You can then ask how does the right mix of components make it different? Here's a more biological example. As I said, the earlobe is a nice example. The earlobe has both soft tissue and somewhat harder tissue called cartilage. This is mixed together. So the soft tissue sits here. This soft tissue sits here. The earlobe has no cartilage. It has a large blood supply. Anyone who's heard, who sort of cuts their ear, will know that this blood bleeds substantially from that point. It's very elastic. I can twist it around and change the shape, and then it comes back. I mean, I can't. Whatever, you know, those of you whose teachers have occasionally twisted your ears, you will have, will be you know, happy to discover the ear has gone back to its old position after it was twisted. So it's a soft material, it's a dilly material, and it's a self-repairing material, unlike the other one. They can, they're repairable. If I cut it, it will it will bleed, but then that will be, will be covered over again. And we can't. Again, the, the, the child that is sleeping like this, you know, we have a somewhat distorted ear after a while when we get that. It comes out, we pick it up again, and then it goes back to its normal shape. But it made it all right. Here's an example of a very distorted ear though. The soft but solid material is more deep, but it also flows very slowly. It flows by a fork. And a very heavy earring that pulls it down is one way of applying a fork to a ear though. Over a long enough period of time, you can change the shape of a ear Here's an interesting example. This is a standard statue of Buddha. The earlobes of the Buddha statue are almost always shown as being elongated. That's because before Buddha became the Buddha, he was a plain and ordinary person. He wasn't an ordinary person, he was a prince originally. He wore a very heavy ear adornment that had to pull down his earlobe to give you a structure that actually looked like. So it's been around the whole process of stretching your earlobe through wearing a bonnet has been around for a long time many tens of thousands of years. But all of this relies on the fact that this living biological material is soft, self-repairing, and can change its shape while remaining living over a long enough period to apply the force. That's where all of our ideas are coming in together, the one that we discussed earlier. So those of you who sort of sneeze from time to time will have undergone this particular thing we have. Dropping from your neck. Let's go back to coronavirus, COVID 19. That's many, many times. And it's a little particle that comes from people when they breathe, stop, and cough that are invisible to the naked eye that enable it to move from person to person. So the virus is mostly contained when people talk, laugh, shout, scream, cough, etc. And these very, very small droplets that really contain biological fluid. So the major component to the biological fluid that is this part here is something called mucus. Okay. Mucus contains 95% water, 3% of protein, including a protein called mucin and various antibodies, some salt and other substances. The mucin droplets absorb the water, they can swell to several hundred times in volume, within three seconds release in the mucin gland. These cross-link together, as I said, like the, like the ketchup example where they had jumped as basically tied together and I could disrupt those links in order to, when I shook it, in order for it to flow. 
Tem só que três para sair aqui. Então, só assim, se você está com sticky, elástico, e gel, é essa daqui. Então, por que as células antibodies são mais do que o sistema? E isso é necessário para fluctuar todas as partes mortas do sistema que estão sendo desligadas. Mas também pode carregar o vírus de uma pessoa para uma pessoa, quando as pessoas veem o corpo. Então, isso vem com esses which is droplets. And remember I told you about the micron being roughly the size of a biological, of a bacteria. And 1 to 10 to 20 microns is the size of the cell. So these droplets are microns and smaller than microns. If they usually call droplets if they're more than about 5 microns in size. But those are tiny little ones over here that you can many different types of these. And in fact, they're actually tiny enough that they can remain suspended in the air for a long time. The larger they are, the more likely they will fall through the ground under gravity. The smaller they are, for many hours they can stay in the, in the air around you. Which is why when people say, oh, you know, I got COVID-19, but I didn't see anybody, I was very careful, I didn't, you know, I made sure that I avoided everybody, etc. The answer is that even if you are alone, you stand in a lift, you don't know who's been in the lift an hour ago, two hours ago, three hours ago, breathing, coughing, speaking, etc. into that lift. That releases these tiny droplets of mucus. The tiny droplets of mucus contain COVID-19 virus. SARS-CoV-2, that remains suspended in the air until you, you know, happily come along to the lift, you look around, you see that no one is there, you breathe in, or what you're breathing in, and they take the virus together with these tiny droplets. So that's again the reason why you might wear a mask. This is without a mask, you're emitting lots of droplets over here, even though you may feel, you may be asymptomatic, you may feel that you don't have, you're perfectly all right, you don't have a fever, you're very, very mild throat tissue, that should be okay, so go away. And you walk by this without wearing a mask there. Over here, by wearing a mask, you reduce the amount of droplets that are coming out of here. And overall, reduce the chances that someone you're in contact with is exposed to the coronavirus. Here's my last example, when I finish up. This is a white blood cell. It's actually hunting a bacteria. And you can see how it changes its shape. You know, it's basically tracking it and moving around and trying to locate it wherever it goes. So this little example has everything that we might need. It has biology, it has physics, it has chemistry. The biology, this is finally a biological living entity, a single cell with the ability to move. It processes the information. It's following the trajectory of, it's not moving at random. It's following the trajectory of something that's trying to eat us. Like it's trying to eat us. Okay? In order to do that, it must change its shape in very particular ways. As you can see, the whole construction must be such that it allows it to move around, change shape, pursue something over here. And there's a lot of chemicals in all of this, basically, because it has chemical components that respond in specific ways that allow it to change the shape, the membrane that sits outside, preventing the what's inside from leaking outside. So, as I said, here's a nice example where you have both a biological phenomenon, a bio biological at its core. But it needs physics and chemistry of how things flow and the complex chemistry of how things are put together in order to be able to behave in this manner. So I think this is my reminder to you. So I hope with these examples, we talked about tomato ketchup, we talked about toothpaste, we talked about ice cream, we talked about mucus, we talked about a whole bunch, we talked about suspension, we talked about laces, all these, these different examples that you can think of. What I wanted to remind you about is the sheer diversity of material. And the fact that many of these materials, you may think that oh, it's just iron and steel and construction and concrete, etc. They're not. There's a whole lot of interesting material that actually soft and squishy and malleable and changes shape and fluid and flows, etc. But we, what I wanted to tell you about today was how you should think about these things that flow and the variety of different types of behavior of things that can actually and that's important because this is the point where biology talks to physics, talks to chemistry all together. And to understand where they talk to each other is, of course, a great part of the science that we actually do. So spend a moment from time to time to think of how remarkable they are when you brush your teeth tomorrow morning when you have a nice cream in the evening. Think a little bit about what it does to bring that sensation, to bring that object to you. So thank you. So I'm happy to be here.
Okay, we are taking questions now. Good afternoon, sir. This is Padya Chaudhary. So, what were the other like round things we could see in the last clip that the white blood cells were go was going around? Actually, these are other these are other cells. We can't be red blood cells in my diagram. How they look? I'm not very sure what they are. I think there are other sorts of cells in this, or maybe they will be part of the image. They aren't important to this. The guy is really chasing this little thing that you, this little feature that you can actually see there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Earth Singlet from New Delhi. I wanted to ask, so like a sponge can be compressed, but it does not really flow. So does it classify as a, a like soft <coughs> matter or not? That's a very good question. So typically it wouldn't really qualify as soft matter because it's sort of rigidly put together. And it's more an elastic material. It's such that we know, because it's easy to show that just the energy that you have in, in, in you can easily demonstrate a state of shape. That we think of it conveniently as soft matter. In somewhere in between hard and soft. It doesn't flow in the sense of being liquid. The, the molecules are not flowing around themselves in a complicated way, and they return to their position the moment you repeat it. So I would think of that as an elastic solid <coughs> that is also soft. Okay, thank you. Liquid. So, what is the time scale for flow of glass in a building? You know, will you see changes visibly in 100 years, 1000 years? The answer is that you won't, unless you heat the glass up. But once you form the glass and put it into a window, then you will not see any visible change over 10,000 years. This is a very unusual property of glass. And understanding why glass behaves like that, why it is a solid without being crystallized, is one of the most important and yet unsolved problems of, of this field. Let me say it very clearly. Why is something that doesn't flow in it or how could it appear to be solid? Why is it that the atoms are in a completely random relationship? It's, there's nothing of, of any type of regular periodic order inside that. Why does that happen? So you will not see it. The old argument about medieval cathedrals and having, it's just an artifact of how they were made, not so much because they actually flowed. Hello sir, my name is Alpha Chaudhary. I wanted to just ask if there is any material that is hard but also soft. In this way of thinking about it, no. but. An example is suspension. Suspension has liquid that flows, but it also has hard little things inside it, such as pieces of sand. So depending upon the scale in which you look at and what you're looking at, you can have a combination of hard and soft behavior. But in the way I talked about response to a change in trying to change its shape, typically solid materials will try to come back to their earlier shape, their elastic in nature. Liquid materials will tend to flow, and they're only concerned how fast are you going to change their shape. And that will determine the resistance that they provide to that change of shape. So they are thought of in that broad sense, you know, in the, the suspension is something that flows actually. If I look at the internal structure of the suspension, there's stuff that is very hard inside it. There's stuff that is like another sort of water which flows very easily. Yeah. Hello. Uh, my name is Arnav. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Uh, one of my questions is like, uh, you talked about when you stretch a rubber band too much, then like it just breaks that elasticity and then all its properties will wonky. For the flows that we're talking about here, do similar properties work as in like, if you apply too much force on sauce or like ice cream or something, would something weird start happening? Would its properties just differentiate? I mean, for ice cream, certainly, if I, sort of, I can touch it very slightly, it won't change the shape. I can sort of bite into it, it certainly will change the shape. For most materials, there is some sort of threshold. For things that are pure, they purely flow, even the slightest bit of, 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 of pressure that you might apply to change the shape will, will give you a change in shape. 
stuff that's in between, when you talk about the catchy piece, there was a huge stress. There was a certain amount of force that I had to apply before things began to move. So that's a different category. The regular solid stuff, I change its shape, I release it and it goes back. Like this, like the, like the, the, the rubber band. So it all, there are different categories of materials that behave differently. All ranging from the pure fluid to the somewhere fluid, somewhere form solid, depending upon what the history was, to something that's very solid and really comes back to form shape. Solid and elastic. So I am Agastya Vashni from Mumbai, sir. So, so is it possible to computationally model the nature of soft matter in some way? It is. It is. And there's a, I mean, a large number of people do exactly that. They have they try to model long molecules, long polymers. They put many polymers together. They try to understand how they behave when you heat them up, when you float them, etc. So much of the design, for example, is accompanied by a lot of computer simulations. These are complicated simulations because they're not like simple acids, not like ammonia or water or anything. They're complicated, long, polymeric systems, as I said, made up of many different units. And to simulate them is usually much more harder than to simulate them. But you're right, many people do computer simulations of soft matter to try and understand the properties. Hello, sir. Uh, so, um, I don't think maybe this will not go directly, but so we have read about. Um, stuff called non-Newtonian fluids um, called say, oobleck and like, people do all sorts of fun backyard experiments and so uh, the, the primary property of like, non-Newtonian fluids that I know of is that they behave like hard substances um, when you hit them hard and behave like soft liquidy substances when you are sort of gentle with them. So could you please talk a little bit more about this specific property of why like, and what is a non-Newtonian fluid versus what is a Newtonian fluid? Thank you. Okay, so that, I mean, it's hard to sort of describe that further without writing down an equation or something like that, which I don't want to do. But all the examples that I showed you, they're all non newtonian fluids. So being a non newtonian fluid is a generic description of pretty much anything that fluid that you can encounter. But there can be different types of non newtonian fluids. In one, it becomes easier, the, the more, the, type, the faster it takes to change the shape, some fluids flow e more easily versus with more. But some other types of fluids, Flow, find it harder to flow the faster it takes to change them. So these are different categories of fluids that are relevant to this discussion here. The ones that I showed you here, for example, the ice cream, etc., the non neutronic fluids, that become easy, that flows more easily once they apply force. And so too for the two case. So the so as if we say one technical term here, it's called the shear rate. The larger the shear, the relationship between the shear rate and the force that is required to change the shape is linear for a Newtonian fluid and is non linear for a non Newtonian fluid. And, and this is only targeted at you because I know that you know these terms, but not for anything. Thank you. So, so uh, my question is, basically you started with any material which will have order and also the spacing will change which will further lead to different categories of substances. But in case of complex uh, fluids or complex uh, materials that you talked about, what intrinsically is changing um, which is leading to such changes? And also when the yield point is crossed, we see a shift in their behavior. So. What exactly is happening during that point that the behavior is just changing? So, so the materials that I talked about are usually mixtures of different types of materials. Some have solid components, some have liquid components, some parts flow. So it's all the behavior all together that I wanted to actually describe. So often there's no clear distinction between between you know, water solid, water liquid. It's a combined object that together behave like a liquid. Or as the new word used out, the non newtonian method, that flow in a specific way. The most general way of thinking about it is what is the, how does it respond when I try to change its shape? And how a material responds when I try to change its shape makes a difference between something that's elastic and something that flows. If something that's elastic, I try to change its shape and I believe that it goes back to its old shape. Something that is plastic or flows when I apply a force, it stays in the new position and doesn't go back. 
the liquid flow into any container that it wants, whichever shape it is. It doesn't remember the shape of the previous container. That's what it is. No, it's just changing the shape very fast. Let me describe it here. Your second question was about? Let's say there will be a yield point and That's right. Yeah. After the yield point, so just look at the physics of what is happening. This, initially you have a bunch of long molecules, polymers that are tied together at various points. By pressing on it and breaking the ring system, shaking the bottle, and breaking these connections between them. Once I break the connection, I can allow these molecules to flow almost independently. But once they're all tied together, I basically have to move everything together because they can't be separated from each other. So what the yield point does is just the amount of force that is required to break a significant number of these attachments, after which these molecules can flow without remembering that they were tied to this or that. So they're not tied anymore. This can flow and that can flow all together. So they don't have to all be dragged together at the same time. So that's the difference and that's where the yield point is. Hi, Gautam. Uh, uh, so, so the pitch drop experiment, the long experiment, what, are, what, what, what has been done with that experiment with that people are really curious about waiting for that long period of money, etc., etc.? That's a good question. Um, the interest is how do you look at fluids that flow very, 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 very slowly? We can know about liquids that flow faster. We can control them and do it. It's hard to do a controlled experiment on a glacier that flows very slow. So what can you do in a lab that really pushes you to the limits of how slowly you can make things change shape? And it's only changing shape under gravity. We're just waiting for gravity to do its own magic. But this is an example of something that is, it takes eight years for anything to happen, or 10 years for anything to happen, and you have to camera pointed at that, or take regular pictures of it as it's shape. But I think it's really an attempt to push the, how slowly can I get something happen? right up to the limits of what can be done in a lab. Beyond that, I don't think it has any intrinsic interest or value. It's really that particular question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You might want to look at it as a change in shape of that. Now, of course, you can do this with high-speed cameras on pretty much anything that you in the form of drops. But in this particular case, you can really do a lot of very intensive measurements on the, on the changes in shape, which is because it takes so long. I think it's more to make a point rather than anything else. So this is the slowest thing you can possibly have. So can you please explain briefly what is meant by Newtonian and non-Newtonian? Oh. I was trying to not do that. <laughs> okay, but let me tell it to you in a, in, in this, just show you with my hands. Suppose I have a fluid here, then I put my hand on top and a hand below. Now I move my top hand like this forward. So I'm changing the shape of the container. I'm changing the container with square. By moving my top hand and keeping my bottom hand the same, it's not become a parallel look of it. That looks like that. I can do this fast or I can do it slow. If I can just move it back and forth, it changes through the shape. What I can measure is how much resistance am I unseen as I'm moving this back and forth. That resistance is related to the viscosity of the liquid. Because, because what look at what I'm doing. The top line, when I'm moving this here, all the molecules here I want to move together with that. Whereas in the bottom plate, which I'm not moving, all the molecules want to change stuff to that. So these molecules are moving, these molecules are stuck like that. Therefore, there's a change in the velocity of the molecules. And liquids don't like different parts of the system moving at different speeds. But now I've created an experiment which I can make them move at different speeds. Okay. So now I can say, all right, I'm going to do this slowly, faster, 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 and I'm going to measure the resistance. If the relationship between the resistance and the speed which I move it is linear, just a straight line, the more, the, the faster I move it, the faster the, 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 the larger the resistance is, that's called a Newtonian fluid. On the other hand, suppose I go faster and faster and faster, and it becomes suddenly easier, the less resistance. That's a non-Newtonian fluid. In fact, the text are very sheer thinning fluid. As I can tell you, one, at least one or two technical words I should be using. That's called a sheer thinning fluid. For sheer thinning fluid, the faster I use this, the less resistance there is. For sheer thickening fluid, the faster I use this, the more resistance there is. So cornstarch in water is an example of a sheer thickening fluid. Okay. So that those are non-Newtonian because there's a simple linear relationship between how fast I'm actually performing, and the resistance to that definition that there is. That's the difference between Newtonian and non-Newtonian. 
Das ist schon weit. Hi Professor, uh, so my name is Sia and uh, you know they're very familiar to me so like can I remember you had given a lecture in YSP last year I believe something on microbes uh, but like now that you presented us a combination of like physics and uh, chemistry and bio all together like I'm just curious that you know there's a lot of uh, things that are related in physics and chemistry that a lot of scientists work towards but what about biology like for example uh, let's take neurons so we know that uh, when we transmit uh, signals from our neurons, they emit a magnetic field for some time. But like, what is the impact of physics and biology in that sense? Is it something huge? Like, is there like any reason, particular reason to study like study in that area? So I, I'm not aware. I'm not aware of this, but I can give you a general answer. In usually in most situations in biology, magnetic fields don't do very much. They're only potentially important when birds navigate. Because they seem to navigate over long distances by sensing the Earth's magnetic field, probably because of very small magnetic pieces inside their inside their brain associated with essentially picking up a very very small signal. The Earth field. But for much of for what at least for what we know, for much of biology, that doesn't matter. Magnetic fields don't matter. Electric fields actually might matter more, and that's something that we that we still have to understand. What is the role of electric fields? In fact, the whole process by which the nerve cell transmits information is through a ripple in the electric field that is conveyed along. And that's because different ion channels open up, allow charged ions to enter in at different points here. So that's when the traveling wave of an electric field is converted into information at the other end. So usually, electric fields are more important than magnetic fields. And this is still very actively being looked at. How exactly? That's where physics talks to biology in a very gen central sense. I already asked a question, but I had another. Go ahead. Uh, the discussion shifted to uh, shear thinning and shear thinning fluids. I actually had a question about research in that. So uh, recently, they started uh, seeing that shear thickening fluids can even be used in like bulletproof vests and military grade uh, scientific research development. Uh, what do you think is the future of such materials in everyday life and like uh, even uh, space exploration and such other like very difficult terrain movements? That's a very good question. In fact, that's again a nice, nice example of why you might want it in a bulletproof vest. We want it to be easy to put on a bulletproof vest. We don't want to wear something solid, concrete thing in front of you to hold or made of lead. We want it to be able to flow easily. But we also want it to stop a bullet. So one way to do that is to make something that responds like a solid when it's being hit by a projectile at high speed, but otherwise flow. So that's a very, very good example of how you can make a material based on the principle that I told you about respond in a particular way. What might be further applications of this? I don't know. I mean, it's really, wherever you sense that there's an application of something like this, you can usually find a chemist or a chemical engineer to be able to make that for you. That's, if you want to be an entrepreneur and look at this field, the secret lies in finding the right application, just like the, the, just like the application of bulletproof press, which is a very nice application. I can't think of anything offhand. But you know, I think we should use our imagination to find out where now that you know what these things are and where they're used. To think of novel ways of, of applying them in new situations. Where it would be useful to have a shear thickening fluid? Something that behaves like a solid inside shape shape part, but otherwise behaves like a liquid. 